Greetings, brothers and sisters. Demi Lovato's reflects on frozen yoga, frozen yogurt drama. I'm still learning. <laughs> you remember she accused this place of, I don't know, aggressive diet culture because they had sugar-free and gluten-free cookies and things like this. And then she got rolled on the internet because she was just babbling in incoherently about the place and wasn't making legitimate points. And she was attacking a small business and she got embarrassed Kind of, I guess. I don't know. But now she says this. I got a bunch of stuff to get to. I got all this Biden stuff to get to. And um, truth or stuff, like how everything is um, more out there now. And so um, I'm going to probably do the Biden thing separately, but we'll see. Chrissy Teigen stuff and, you know, stuff with Tucker Carlson. I mean, just a bunch of stuff here. Every time I've made a statement over Instagram, Instagool, or Twitter... I felt like it's gotten lost in translation a little bit. It was me talking about something I was very passionate about pertaining to the diet culture. And I realized that because I was so passionate, I let my emotions get the best of me and didn't allow, and it didn't allow me to explain where I was coming from as easily as it would have been on a podcast. You know, again, you're not getting it. <laughs> Brain damage. Have conversations where people can see my face, they can hear my voice, and they can see that I'm still learning. Well, no, you're not. And I'm by no means expert on many, many things, but I'm willing to learn about it. And I'm willing to continue to have conversations that either educate me or others or how to make the world a better place. That is not in any way a correct char characterization with what happened here. <laughs> It's not even close, right? That's not how this thing went. But it's almost kind of like an apology. And it, it shows you like if she had gotten support and people were digging what she was saying and she didn't get caught holding a doctor, Diet Dr. Pepper uh, uh, microphone because she was getting paid to do so, then she would have had a completely different, um, you know, position here. But this is the sort of thing you got to do when the internet turns on you. And it's, you know, random most of the time now. Inside Chris Harrison's shocking downfall as The Bachelor host in a $9 million payout. And if this guy did something wrong, why are you paying him $9 million? Like, I dislike The Bachelor on a, you know, fundamental level. It's one of the worst shows and ideas ever in television history, and there's been some bad ones. And this guy is fake as F and just annoying. And so I don't care about if the Bachelor, you know, Bachelor Nation, I mean, the whole thing disappeared. Like everybody, you know, everybody who's been on the show, everybody who watches the show, just, you know, a hole opened up in the earth <laughs> and swallowed up the whole Bachelor Nation. But this guy was supposedly fired for saying things that were racially unsensitive, insensitive, and they gave him $9 million and fired him. Like, why $9 million? Like, you got a $9 million payout for being racist? Is that how it goes, ABC? I mean, just, you know. These things don't add up is what I'm saying, right? They don't, you know. They Why would you give him $9 million if he did something wrong? Like, you could fire him for a cause. But there would be a lawsuit here, and it wouldn't hold the whatever it is, right? They're just... You know, it's all fake. Speaking of fake, Chrissy Teigen has no idea what the F Michael Costello is doing. She's the guy that recently claimed that she bullied her. Chrissy Teigen says she's surprised and disappointed by Michael Costello's bullying ac accusations against her, saying the alleged DMs he posted between the pair are fictional. And here's her Chrissy Teigen, her official check mark. No idea what the F Michael Costello was doing. He just released a statement where he didn't at all acknowledge how fake the DMs were. And now he claims those emails. Now he claims to have emails that don't exist. So while he conjures those up, hopefully with someone more talented in fakes this time here. So I guess this is her statement. And um, so she goes after the guy. 
in a very hostile, bitchy way. So I guess her time of being remorseful for her bullying ways, I think the guy is probably just trying to sponge in on, you know, her cancellation. You know, this is getting great. Like, <laughs> you got people who are trying to sponge in and, you know, gain attention for themselves. I mean, it just shows you the seedy nature of all this cancel culture and Hollywood culture and all the rest of it. The vultures are out, right? You know, in the year of this schism, what people are about is authenticity, all this fake stuff, the schism between the, you know, this is all these ways that people are separate from reality. And I'm talking about the schism between what you present in life and on social media and what you are inside as a person. The schism what you in, in terms of what you fake to believe in and what you really believe in. So many people don't believe in what they're presenting out there in, in life on a, you know, in terms of who they pretend to be, the, the brand that they create. And news media personalities, I mean, people are just leaving them in droves because they're all fake as F. And then MSNBC put out this wonderful commercial that validates all these things. What does her ascension mean to you? Ask a simple question. Ask a simple question. We think she is the first woman of color vice president. Ask everyone. So that's about Kamala. So they're saying that Kamala, they're trying to pose that, that people really like Kamala. She polled at 1% of Democrats before she quit. She couldn't even make it to the voting, right? She didn't even make it to the game. She was so unlikable. She went up to like 15, 20% at one point, 12% for a little bit. She was coming in second to Joe Biden for about two weeks. And then they focused in on her. And that's when people decide they don't like her, that she's unlikable, right? That people didn't identify with her and would, wouldn't vote for her. I'm talking about Democrats, not even, you know, the Republicans and the independents that were certainly not going to vote for her. She was unelectable. And so this is what happened. That's happened in reality, right? There, there was, you know, an election. Elections have consequences, right? And so, um, and so they're trying to pretend that this historic moment that was completely contrived because she couldn't make it to the actual voting. She quit before New Hampshire and Iowa. Like, that's a fact. That's a historical fact that she couldn't make it to the election. Her campaign fell apart because she couldn't connect with Democrats. They didn't want to vote for her. And she got a lot of run. She got a lot of play as a serious candidate. She got a lot of news coverage, and they were pushing her out there. And people said, no, we don't like her. But they put her in as vice president anyway. And now they're pretending, you know, with all the masks, all the <laughs> all this fake stuff, that she rocked it. And that this is... This is some, this guy's question, he asked the right question, should compel you, compel you, women for Kamala, should compel you to watch their crappy TV network. This is an ad for them. What does her ascension mean to you? Ask a simple question. He asked a simple question. Oh, wow. Can I watch more of this? This looks compelling. <laughs> oh, where can I get more of me of this simple question? He asked a simple question to some teenager who's, you know, got a Kamala shirt on and doesn't look fake or staged at all. Everything. She is the first woman of color vice president. Ask everyone you know what matters to them. Because my life matters. This kid is putting this up. But again, they're pro-abortion. <laughs> and, you know. Where do we go from here? I don't know, Mika. Your show sucks, so I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I, up? Like, <laughs> I don't think you could go down. Ask the why. Why? Why? Why is this happening? The ha why is this happening? We don't know. We don't. Ah, we can't figure it out. We. Ah, you know, you guys can send your audience over to me, and I'll tell you why it's happening. <laughs> like I know, I know the answer. Why? Why? Why is this? This is such a bad commercial. How? How does? How, how did you get your politics? Please. How did you do it? How? We ask whys. You know, when we ask questions, sometimes it's a why, sometimes it's a how, sometimes it's a what. I mean, this is like, like you know, those are the kind of questions we ask. Well, hows and whys and whats. 
from here. Ask the why. Why? Why? Why is this happening? The how. How does? How, how did you get your politics? Please. Back. The wait a minute. No. The wait a minute. What's going on here? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. They ask. Wait a minute. Okay. I'll Be tough back. on the answers. It was deliberate deceit. Favor facts over conspiracies. Facts over conspiracies. You hear that? Okay. I'll Be tough back. on the answers. It was deliberate deceit. Favor facts over conspiracies. Facts over conspiracies. So they're now trying to come out and be the anti-conspiracy news, even though they had so many conspiracies about Trump. Like Trump, they were coming in every day, and they're still doing this, both them and CNN. Like, they're not anti-conspiracy. When Hillary Clinton did this, right? When Hillary Clinton did this, I mean, Hillary Clinton had all this conspiratorial stuff. I got a clip of that. I'll insert that here. The great story here for anybody willing to find it and write about it and explain it is this vast right-wing conspiracy that has been conspiring against my husband since the day he announced for president. You mentioned attacks on the early 90s. Do you still believe there's a vast right-wing conspiracy? Don't you? <laughs> I'm asking you. Yeah. It's gotten even better funded. Uh, you know, they brought in some new multi-billionaires to pump the money in. And uh, look, these guys play for keeps. They want to control our country. Senator Sanders and I agree on that completely. They want to rig the economy so they continue to get richer and richer. They could care less about income inequality. And so, yeah, they're not anti-conspiracy, just the ones that are coming out that are so much more compelling than their crappy news. I saw this like on a basketball game or something we were watching. Impractical Jokers, maybe. So. And trust standards over hearsay. This is what we do. We trust standards over hearsay. Yeah, well, people are realizing that you're all liars and they don't want to watch your fake stuff anymore. Your fake, you know, people who are acting fake insincere, inauthentic, right? This came up with Joe Rogan, and this is, you know, I tried to find this ad yesterday, but I couldn't, but finally found it on Twitter. <laughs> they, they published it on Twitter. And so it's a campaign they're running. There was an earlier ad they had. A time frame that is really unprecedented. Do you take responsibility for that? 115 sustained wins. Everybody is back in the game. Where do we go? Yeah, they are. They're back in the game. Uh, what do you make of this report? How does the moment become a sustained movement? And I reported. They go straight to the source. The CIA and the FBI tell them what the news is. From here, during three different presidential administrations. Should we be lifting the tariffs? Because words matter. Because words matter. You know who says that? Words matter. Words matter. He says it just like that. Joe Biden. Words matter. Because words matter. If you've watched my videos, he says it over and over again. Because elections matter. Words matter, right? Words matter. Because words matter. So that's them taking his talking points and saying the same thing. Interrogate the truth. They get the truth and they interrogate the crap at it. They waterboard the truth. MSNBC, we waterboard the truth. Should we be lifting the tariffs? Because words matter. This is what we do. Suck. <laughs> this is what we do. We suck, right? <laughs> They're getting rolled by social media, people who are authentic. And it's not necessarily being right. It's just being who you are. Like that's the first thing that has to happen. That's what I said about Trump. Trump wasn't trying to pretend, even though he was lying and whatever he was. He was that he was authentic to who he was, and they all hated it. He wasn't doing what politicians do and act in a certain way. He wasn't acting political. He wasn't acting presidential. He was being authentic Trump. And Trump wasn't great, like, you know, Trumpers think he was great. But the reason people liked him is because he was who he was, right? He wasn't trying to pretend. Like, he lied. And he's a flim-flam man, but he, you know, in that, he wasn't, you know, pretending not to be. And this is, you know, the inauthentic news. So I saw this yesterday, and I really can't cover the subject matter here. 
for you know obvious reasons. But Tucker Carlson had this report that you can't find anywhere. You can find it in this article on Huffington Post. And they, you know, uh, CNN and MSNBC have been, it's a laughable conspiracy theory. And their points and their fact-checking is remarkably bad in terms of their arguments against what he said. But here's, and Tucker Carlson, you know, said that he missed what happened in 2001 and that this thing was a lot like that, right? And he apologized because remember there's that question, you know, that um, I talked about that yesterday in a video. You know, Adam versus the man asked him some questions about it. And he came out on people who were truthers. He was like, come on, no, come on, right? But now he says he's sorry, I owe you an apology. And I cover that here, so maybe, I don't know. But one-sixth truthers. This is one-sixth truthers. And so they're now using the word truther, right? This is about January 6th, but they're using the word truther. And so this is where, again, you know, this is a battle that's happening. There's no winner because the system can't be saved. I mean, I, you know, I can see it more and more, but this is the type of stuff that happens when your system collapses, you know, the snake eating its own tail. This is the kind of president you get. Joe Biden isn't a mistake. It's kind of president Trump isn't a mistake. These are the kind of presidents you get when the apocalypse is happening, when your country is collapsing and the world system is collapsing. This is the kind of stuff that happens, right? This is the, you know, the lies that have to be purged out of your system that were, you know, have been around forever. Like all the evils that are coming to the surface now have been around forever. And they're all acknowledging it. And the news media is trying to, you know, contrast themselves. They're getting destroyed on social media by authentic people who are coming up with more accurate and more sincere analysis of reality. The news media has failed. And instead of saying, okay, we're not, you know, getting it, right? You know, we're not able to rise up to that. We're not able to, you know, we're being eclipsed. We're being, you know, overshadowed by people who are doing, individual people who are doing a better job than we are instead of rising up to that and say, all right, we got to learn from them. We got to see which way the wind's blowing. They're saying we're the opposite of that. (laughs) We're the opposite of truth. (laughs) And we're just going to be fake and, you know, pretend that we're, you know, into what we're doing and we're just going to go down with our ship and, you know, the country in itself. Like, just be honest. But the problem is, once the truth comes out, the system collapses. So I wanted to include this. I, um, you know, I've been having this up on my toolbar for a number of days. Joe Biden at the EU summit. And uh, it starts off here with this woman welcoming him. And he's so low energy, like you can barely hear him. And, you know, he's wearing out from the trip and like just another level of embarrassment here. We need to team up and join up to tackle the big challenges we have ahead of us. So from our side, a very, very warm welcome to Brussels and to Europe. Thank you both very much. Uh, It's been one of the great pleasures uh, getting to uh, know you both uh, more personally than just in terms of our official positions. And we're at the G7, and again today, I apologize. I kept my colleagues uh, uh, in the, the, the closed meeting. But um, I want to... Uh, um, you know. He's just so low energy. <laughs> like, this is how he is most of the time. You know, he has these moments where he gets fired up or, you know, he comes running out all pumped up or whatever. And those are the things they show you. But most of the time he's just low energy because, I mean, he's like, you know, he's old, right? He's lost it. I mean, not like he was good in his prime. Like he sucked in his prime. So that shows you. This is somebody who wasn't great in his prime. And now he's, you know, doesn't have the the energy and the consciousness and he's got whatever mental functioning dementia going on, right? You know, this is uh, 
I haven't been back to Brussels uh, in the EU since uh, 2017. And uh, since the, back then, uh, also the first summit back in 2014. Uh, for me. But I brought the A team with me uh, today. He's got the A team. You know, he was going to bring the B team, but he decided he'd go with the A team. And, um, you know, I've said both publicly and privately that America's back, and which is why we're here. In He's saying it. He said America's back. America is back. We're back. We weren't there. We disappeared for a while, but we're back. When Trump, like when Trump was president, like America just disappeared off the face of the earth. But now we're back. We're in full force. Um, I'm happy to have with me today the members of my cabinet, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. He suffers from the problem of having worked with me for years. Yeah, everything, no, working with me is the worst. Um, and, uh, and That's why I ran for president. <laughs> and uh, also trade representative, Ambassador Catherine Tai, uh, who is... I'm taking a little nap now. I gotta take a nap now. I gotta take a nap. I gotta take a little nap. Made some real progress already. Um, and, uh, and Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo, who was a first-rate governor and one of the brightest... First, I'm going to introduce my staff to these European people because, you know... It doesn't matter. <laughs> people that we've worked with and, uh, and agreed to come on as, uh, as our Secretary of Commerce. And uh, one of the things that uh, I've, we, you and I were talking about will come as no shock to either of you. Europe is, uh, is uh, our, our natural partner. Our natural par partner. They used to own us. Europe used to own us, right? But now we're partners. And the reason is we're committed to the same democratic norms and institutions and, are, uh, and they are increasingly under attack. And, uh, and we, I've said before, and I apologize to repeat, oh, I didn't, I, Jake Sullivan, you know, Jake is my NASA security advisor. Hey, wow, let's get this going. The more introductions, more introductions from JoJo. I'm leaving out a lot of people here. I apologize. I'm going to get in trouble, but... Anyway, we'll get back. He's going to get in trouble. Who with? Who do you get in trouble with? Like, how does, what does being in trouble mean? He says this multiple times. He's going to Europe, and he keeps on saying over and over again, I'm going to get in trouble. If I don't read the list of, of, of reporters that were given to me in order and have them ask questions in order, I'm going to be in trouble. I mean, he said it, I've documented this in my videos, and I'm sure he probably said it more than I know because I haven't watched every bit of footage, but he says it all the time. I'm going to be in trouble, but to who? To who, Joe? To who, Mr. Magoos? Back to that. But um, uh, we, um, uh, you know, there's a lot that uh, that is, is, is happening. I used to always, uh, my friends would... Uh, he hasn't said anything in the last minute. Like, he's just... I mean, he hasn't said anything significant since being there, but like this is him without a script. A kid me uh, uh, in the United States Senate the years I served there for always quoting Irish poets. I think I quoted Irish poets because I'm Irish. He quoted Irish poets. So this is his message to the EU summit. <laughs> I quote Irish poets. I, let's, 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 jump, let's jump off from that. It's not the reason I quote them because they're the best poets in the world. That's why I quote them. But, but all kidding. The Irish are the best poets, and I just thought I'd say that here in Europe, just laying down the gauntlet. Aside, um, there's a there's, there's a, a stanza from a poem of an Irish poet who was just lost. He said, "All's changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty has been born." I think all has changed in the last uh, ten, twelve years. And it's not because of any one person. I think we're in the midst of uh, a terrible beauty having been born, a great shift in... Uh, a great shift is happening. In uh, technology, a great shift in development of the world, and it's causing great anxiety in each of our countries and uncertainty among many of our colleagues is what's going to be their place in the world. 
Let me just scratch myself here. They're going to be replaced by new technology. Are they? Let me put my hand on my face. They're going to no longer have a job. What are they going to do? And that, that comes along at the same time that that also generates when uncertainty is generated politically. You just said you're not going to have a job. What are you going to do? You know, robots are going to replace you. We're in a great shift in, uh, in uh, technology, a great shift in development of the world, and it's causing great anxiety in each of our countries and uncertainty among many of our colleagues is what's going to be their place in the world. They're going to be replaced by new technology. Are they going to You're going to be replaced by new technology. Their place in the world. They're going to be replaced by new technology. Are they going to no longer have a job? What Are you no longer going to have a job because you've been replaced by AI or a robot? Like JoJo laying it down in a mumbling, you know, like soft as possible tone. What are they going to do? And that, that comes along at the same time that that also generates when uncertainty is generated politically like that about individuals. It also generates some folks who are less than, uh, how can I say it, uh, somewhat more like charlatans uh, trying to uh, um, take advantage of those concerns. And we see it. Like he's saying, Trump is saying we can make America great again when you everyone knows you're going to be replaced by a robot. Like <laughs> these charlatans who lie to you and tell you that your job and your lifestyle can be changed, it can be saved, even though that we all know it can't be because we're moving f full force with this and we don't care who we steamroll over, right? Like that's all, you know, code for that. In Europe, we see it in the United States, we've seen it around the world, this phony populism. Phony populism. People who are talking to the concerns of their subjects, because that's how this really works, their slaves, and saying, yeah, we can stop this from happening. We're on your side. We're listening to you. We hear you. We hear you don't want this to happen. And that's what he's talking about, phony populism with Bernie Sanders and Trump, we actually are listening to you and we're not mansplaining with the things that you don't want to hear, right? This whole social agenda that's happening, this whole Hollywood morality that's being rolled out and people are freaked out because their kids are being indoctrinated into this, the whole everything, right? Now, not that Trump was, you know, Trump's a flim flam man. I'll get into this more in just a bit. But Trump actually listened and appealed to what the American people wanted to hear and, and delivered that message, and he just called it phony populism, right? This just tells you everything you need to know. He's admitting to it all, right, that these changes are coming. You're not going to have a job because they have robots. Your place in the world is no longer, you know, things are changing. Technology is changing, and that all these people are freaked out about it. And how do we deal with it in the phony populism that people are saying, hey, this doesn't have to change because they're pushing it forward with their, you know, European partners. Uh, somewhat more like charlatans uh, trying to uh, um, take advantage of those concerns. And we see it in Europe, we see it in the United States, we've seen it around the world, this phony populism. So it seems to me that the best answer to deal with this, these changes is that uh, um, to have a circumstance where our economies grow and they grow together and they grow still based on the value set that united us in the first place. Economic growth is not possible. I've talked about this in terms of the debt. We do share just the same basic values of human dignity, human rights. As I, my colleagues, have, I'll be very co colloquial with you. Um, my dad, uh, at a transition where in, uh, in the city we lived in, coal was dying and no longer relevant. He, oh, he was not a, my great grandfather was a, a, a coal miner. He was a, a mining engineer, but he wasn't a coal miner. He was a coal mining engineer. This is the part I saw. I hadn't seen the earlier part, but I was watching this and I was like, he's going to tell another family story. 
Now, first of all, coal mining engineers design mines and develop systems and processes for extracting coal from the earth. Anyone wishing to work in this field must complete complete a bachelor's engineering degree that focuses on mining, geology, and civil engineering. This is an educated position, and their starting salaries are from sixty to sixty-five thousand dollars. So, if he was doing this, right? If his grandfather was doing this, he wasn't a coal miner. Coal miners suffer, you know, horrible stuff, right? So Joe Biden also had a plagiarism scandal where he lifted speeches from other people in 1987 when he first ran for president and he lied about his family. He said that they were coal miners and a bunch of stuff that he lifted from the stories that he lifted and stole from other people. And then that's ruined his candidacy, right? And so um, he said this, I made some mistakes but now the exaggerated shadow of those mistakes has begun to obscure the essence of my candidacy and the essence of Joe Biden. It cannot measure the health of our children, the quality of our education, the joy of their play. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. Let us pledge that our generation of Americans will pay any price, bear any burden, accept any challenge and meet any hardship to secure the blessings of prosperity and the promise of opportunity for our children. We shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to assure the survival and the success of liberty. So he got caught lifting these speeches, among other things. And I started thinking as I was coming over here, why is it that Joe Biden is the first in his family ever to go to a university? Why am I the first Kinnick in a thousand generations to be able to get the university? Why is it that my wife who's sitting out there in the audience is the first in her family to ever go to college. Why is Glennis the first woman in her family in a thousand generations to be able to get the university? No, it's not because they weren't as smart. It's not because they didn't work as hard. It's because they didn't have a platform upon which to stand. Does anybody really think that they didn't get what we had because they didn't have the talent? or the strength, or the endurance, or the commitment. Of course not. It was because there was no platform upon which they could stand. So this is from the Washington Post. I mean, this is them actually covering Joe Biden. But then Joe Biden re-erects false claims that helped ruin his 1988 presidential run. Biden says, guys like me, the first in my family to go to college, we are as good as anybody else, and guys like Trump, who inherit everything and squandered what they inherited, are the people I've always had a problem with. And so he just said his grandfather was a coal engineer, and you need to go to college. You know, you're not a coal miner, you're a coal engineer. You lived in, coal was dying is no longer relevant. He, oh, he was not a, my great-grandfather was a, a, a coal miner. He was a, a mining engineer. But when in northeastern Pennsylvania, when coal died, my dad was a salesperson and the economy collapsed and we moved to another part where there were jobs in southern and to down. So this is what his vision for you is. This is his vision, JoJo's vision for you. The economy collapsed in Pennsylvania because of coal mining going out of business. And, you know, coal sucks for the environment. And it's horrible. Coal miners, you know, they get this stuff called black lung. I mean, just bad stuff. But, you know, and it destroys the the earth. I mean, it's just horrible. But, you know, this is what he's talking about in terms of climate change. They're going to get rid of coal mining, for example, and other things. And... Your jobs like that are going to disappear. And some of the jobs maybe are bad jobs or things that, you know, aren't necessarily good for you and the environment. But this is not just 
coal mining, this is across the board because he just said it. People are scared because te technology is going to replace their jobs, right? And he's making this story. Oh, yeah, my family was in Pennsylvania. And then we moved to Delaware. And then I was the first guy to go to college and I became a lifelong politician. So it all works out. Um, in Delaware, at the very, just across the Pennsylvania border. And my family, my siblings and I would hear him all, often use the following expression. He'd say, Joe, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. And we're going to take that away and replace it with a robot. <laughs> we're taking your dignity away and replacing it with a robot. He said, Joe, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about your place in the community. It's about being able to look your child in the eye and say, honey, it's going to be okay. And mean it. I think we sometimes forget that. It's about the dignity of the worker and them being able to hold their head high. And so I think we have an enormous opportunity if we think in terms of these changes, particularly in terms of global warming, if we think of it in terms of jobs, the kind of jobs that we're going to have to create to preserve the environment are jobs that can pay well, that are going to be new technologies that working class, blue collar workers, as we say in the States, will be able to make more money. Be able that's what they say in the States. We'll be able to make more money. From here, where is the money going to come from? Like, how does what you're talking about generate money and income to where jobs are going to be better for people and create more jobs? Like, is it the government, you know, printing money? Like, he's talking about the infrastructure bill and things like this and going further into debt because it has, it's not business. This isn't, you know, this isn't creating a business. The green energy stuff isn't going to create a business. I mean, there's going to be, you know, places that make solar panels or whatever that stuff is or whatever, you know, green energy things that they have and people to install them. But that's not going to generate enough jobs in the market that he's talking about, right? In terms of all these blue collar workers who aren't going to have the kind of skill set that translates into those jobs those few jobs compared to all the, you know, say coal miners that are down the mine, physically mining coal. Able to do well. And, but we have to, all of us accommodate those changes and provide for them. And so I think we have a lot to deal with from COVID-19 to, um, uh, to whether or not we're in a position that we can generate the kind of uh, you know, strengthening transatlantic trade and technological cooperation. They're sort of a different set of priorities with the same objective. How do like-minded countries sharing the same... New World Order agenda. <laughs> ...values um, work together to improve the living standard for not only our people, but for the rest of the world. And I think we have the capacity to do that. But it's going to take an awful lot of hard work and determination. And Let me just itch my eye here. Let me itch my eye. Like I'm giving you the Illuminati eye. This is the Illuminati eye signal, everybody. I'll conclude by saying one of the reasons I'm optimistic is because of our younger generations. In Europe as well as the United States, the young generation, this one, is the best educated in American history. Yeah, you, you really, this is what you're banking on? This younger generation that's completely, um, I mean, depressed and broken and doesn't believe they have a future and has limited attention span, is the most entitled and completely indoctrinated, entitled on one hand and indoctrinated by Hollywood morality and Hollywood agenda that's gone out on a cultural and social level. This is the generation you're banking on, the ones that are ratting out their parents. <laughs> it is also the least prejudiced, the most open. And the most woke. And the most, uh, the most committed. 
And I think that we have reason to believe that if we provide... We can really turn them into quality slaves and replace them as robots. ...provide the policies that are consistent to provide for the kind of growth and opportunity for them. And education plays a gigantic part of that. I think, we, I think the future is very, very bright. I think we have an opportunity to do some really very good things. And with that, I should, uh, as my mother would say, I should hush up. And <laughs> hush up, Jojo. Hush up, Magoo. <laughs> and, uh, let this discussion move forward. So to start with, um, going back to what I said earlier. Now, this guy is a complete embarrassment to himself and then all the people that voted for him, that we would have a real president after having Trump. That's what the liberals and the Democrats believed, that this guy was a real career politician and he was a decent man, Joe the Decent, and he was going to reestablish credibility. Like one of the things that he went to Europe for was to reaffirm our commitment to NATO. And that was a part of the getting rid of Trump, who said he didn't want to fight other people's wars, that he didn't want America to be Europe's military, right? That we would have everybody in Europe's back because, you know, that was the original agreement. When they had the Breton, Brenton Woods or Bretton Woods or whatever it was called, there was this meeting they had and then all these powers, these European powers in America, it was 1944, was, you know, they were going to make America dollar the world reserve currency, that all other currencies in the world would be pegged against the dollar. And the countries in Europe, their currency would be a little bit more valued than the dollar. That was part of the agreement. But everybody had to get their, you know, their the value of their currency in comparison to the dollar. So that was significant because it meant that we could just print money. And I believe the guy was, the guy's name was Chirac, I'm not sure, but one of the French presidents they had a war with Vietnam, and they got their butts kicked. And then America had the Vietnam, the Vietnam War, and they saw that the leader saw that we were just printing money, and he was like, "F this!" Right? <laughs> he realized the advantage that America had that we could just print money, and without the same consequences of inflation, or at least as bad in, as inflation as other countries, because we were the world reserve currency. That meant that all currencies would be devalued when the American dollar was devalued. And so he demanded his gold be brought over from like New York or something. It was stored in, you know, New York because of this, you know, agreement. And then Kissinger came up with this idea of the petrodollar. He agreed with the Arab states that they would only sell oil with dollars. So all countries had to convert their money into dollars before they bought oil. And so that created another, you know, the petrodollar, which helped sort of secure as the world's reserve currency. So the reason that Europe wanted America to be the world reserve currency is that our military could be strong and could, you know, with the amount of population that we had, a very warlike population, based on propaganda, that we would, you know, fight all their battles for them. That America would always have the back of Europe like we were their private sort of police force. And Trump said he didn't want to do that anymore. And so that was going to cause economic instability. And that was one of the reasons they got rid of Trump. And Jojo Magoo went to Europe to reassure them. And he was a, you know, doddering old fool, lost. I mean, I covered it all you know many of the mishaps because they couldn't protect him like they did during the election and they saw you know he was supposed to bring more credibility and assurance that america was back and they clearly could see that you know well i guess from the standpoint that he's handled and you know he kept on saying over and over hey i'm gonna be in trouble if i don't do it this way i'm gonna get in trouble you know all these things that he's being managed and so he's not you know a sovereign president president even though Trump wasn't, you know, somebody acting on his own, he has his handlers, this sort of reassured Europe that, you know, JoJo was a managed commodity. And so that was the reason for his trip. But his performance should embarrass everyone who voted for him.
you know. But in reality, this is, you know, his presidency is not a mistake. Like, this is the kind of president we deserve at a time when everything's falling apart. Like, he's admitting that everything's changing with technological growth and this fake populism by Bernie Sanders and Trump wasn't going to, you know, they couldn't deliver on their promises because people are going to be pissed when they find out about the new deal they're getting in terms of, you know, how life is going to be in the future for, you know, the, the next generation. And the older generation has to either accept it or just be erased. And I keep on saying this because people are like, well, it could get better or, you know, someone like Trump can fix it and, and nobody can. I mean, that's the sad reality of what's happening here. You know, everyone has to come to terms with this on their own. When I first started the Heartfulness Meditation years ago, I read Babaji's, a second master of the book's Reality at Dawn. And he had a, a chapter at the end of the book entitled My Vision. I just reread it. I was going to read it for this video, but I'll do that in the future. This video is already really long. But you can find this book at the, um, the Saj Marg um, a bookstore, online bookstore, but it's also Reality at Dawn. If you Google Reality at Dawn and Saj Marg, there is an online version you can read. And this is the, a very simple book that explains the heartfulness system. And when I read the book, I knew I understood it only because I had done the meditation and received the transmission, the energetic transmission you receive when you do the heartfulness meditation. Again, a free system, the transmission in these sittings is, you know, given it, you can get it, these sittings through the YouTube videos and through the app, all these things I've discussed in the past. But at the end of the book, you know, he just lays out how, why the heartfulness system works and how it works. And then he talks about the future and how only spirituality will save this world. And I hadn't thought about being a spiritual person in years. Like I hadn't really thought about God very much or like I had done some, you know, it's a little bit of a few things right before I started the Heartfulness System that made me start thinking about God and divinity a little bit. But I had, through most of my life, I was 29. You know, after I was about 13 or 14, my mom used to have prayer meetings and these like nuns and these people coming to my house. And so when I turned about 14 or 15, like I started a smoke pot and I stopped thinking about God, right? I started a party and just do teenage stuff. But I thought about God when I was a kid quite a bit, and then I didn't. And so I had this profound experience when I started the Heartfulness Meditation, and I was reading this book, and I was like, well, you know, maybe spirituality does need to save the world. Like, what does that mean, right? Because when you watch movies, and I want to cover this in a, a longer video just talking about this concept, why I say only spirituality will save this world. So I'm going to re-say this, you know, more in more detail later. But how many times have you seen the world saved, like in your lifetime, in movies and TV shows? <laughs> you know, like in this year alone, all the movies that have come out, I mean, in terms of all the superhero movies and you know, all these movies, you see the world being saved over and over again by so-called heroes. But in reality, the world isn't been in jeopardy of being destroyed like ever, right? <laughs> like the earth has never been in jeopardy of being destroyed, but the modern day civilization and the nuclear weapons and then some of the other things that we've done, some of the technology that we've been given without really understanding or knowing what that technology is, has made it so that the world is at risk of being destroyed, at least as we know it, and being depopulated, that all life on planet Earth would be destroyed. And so this was him saying that there needed to be an intervention. And then he broke down, you know, the problems with material materiality and the material pursuits of human beings and why only a, you know, movement by the human population to have an internalized 
connection to God would save that. And I thought about this and I, you know, I was like, well, I guess I, you know, I've experienced the transmission, so I might as well have some, you know, open-mindedness to this idea. And then he gave extensive details in what the transformation of the earth was going to be in terms of countries collapsing and, you know, some continents like, like some countries falling into the ocean I mean, just all kinds of, you know, huge shifts to the planet that we're going to start in. Uh, he wrote this in, it was, it was first published in 1956. And he said that by the turn of the century, this stuff would start to show itself. Of course, we had the big event in 2001. But there were going to be massive changes and only our commitment as a race to embracing God within us was going to save the planet. So there was an element of choice that human beings were going to have to choose to have an internalized relationship with God and give up a lot of our freedoms to do the wrong thing. Because when you're in communion with God, you can only make the right decision. Or there's immediate consequences to your, you know, to every part of your being until you make the right decision. But when you just are off the farm, right, when you're off the rails and you aren't connected to God, then you have the freedom to choose wrong all the time and even become a demon or become a devil or whatever it is, right? But once you are, you know, connected to God, you can only choose to do the right thing. And so this giving up our freedom to do the wrong thing was going to be an issue. I mean, that's what people don't want to do is give up the freedom to do wrong. And so then in 2005, these messages or whispers of the brighter world were given. And by that time, I had been practicing the heartfulness system for 20 years. And it had shown me over and over again that it was like, you know, valid, right? <laughs> that it was sincere and it was truthful and it had vast levels to it. And it was the real deal. So I already, you know, now I knew like before I, you know, all right, I'll give it a whirl. But then as I progressed, I was like, all right, yeah, this is, you know, everything that they say has come true. And there was these prophecies given that gave in much more detail and saying that there was a big event starting in 2025, 2026, between those two years. It was a little unclear. He said in 25 years to a message that was given like uh, 2001, right? So it was a little unclear when this was exactly going to happen. But then after that, there would just be a series of what he called upheavals and the bringing down of our civilization and, a, you know, a need, a, a compelling need for human beings to embrace their higher nature. You know, only spirituality will save this world. He talked about the planet being an experiment that had gone awry, right? This was and a lot of things that I, you know, don't need to discuss here. But the details and what he was saying and electromagnetic poisoning and money power and all the things that were embedded in these whispers messages. Most of the message, most of the messages were about, you know, connecting to God and being more loving and things, but there was prophecies and, you know, a need to change. And when I was reading this, I thought, well, most of the sincere practitioners who do heartfulness would want to start to develop and change. My family and I were already in the process of living on a farm, and, and you said people in the future were going to need to work, learn to work with their hands again and things like this, get their hands dirty, that there would be um, you know, a change in the lifestyle of even the so-called wealthy people. Everyone's going to have to commit to living in a more natural way. And so I thought that the majority of people who were sincere, many sincere people, who did the heartfulness system would read these things and want to, you know, start preparing themselves and their children for this future world that was being described. Because if you believed in the system and you believed in the masters of the system, then you would take this inside information and, you know, start preparing yourselves and the future generations for what was about to happen. And that's what I was doing. And there was you know, pushback, <laughs> like, un, you know, unexpected pushback. Almost people were resentful of me. You know, many of them who were people who were senior members of the heartfulness system were condemning or resentful for me 
of me doing these things, right? Of taking these things seriously. Even people saying, you don't really believe that stuff, right? Like this kind of, you know, I mean, this was a shocker to me. People who had, you know, made the heartfulness system the most important thing in their lives, many of them donating, you know, millions of dollars to the system, didn't really believe in these prophecies. And even now I'm a little bit, you know, I still come up against this at times, but people are more aware and awake now with everything that's happened in the past so many years, especially with Corona and things like this. But even that, they're still not, you know, running towards it. They're not saying, oh, wow, we got to do something. We have five years and Dodgy who just gave a, you know, a, a call to people to bring more people into the heartfulness system that he said we have about five years before the big first event. And he hasn't ever talked about that, to my knowledge, publicly. Like he always sort of downplayed it in the past, but now he was just out and out saying it. And I was saying, all right, maybe there'd be some movement. But recently I've come to the conclusion that no, there's not. Really, people aren't, you know, even though they believe in the system and they believe in most of the teachings, they're not willing to hear this. And so this is what I've experienced, not just in, you know, my professional, whatever I do here in with YouTube videos and things, or with people who are, you know, in the heartfulness system or anywhere, you know, in general, that only a few, a small percentage of the population is willing to see what's going on, accept it, even if you don't like it, I don't like it. Like, I don't, you know, I wouldn't, I would be pretty happy if things didn't go in this direction. But I've accepted it years and years ago and then preparing for it, that there needs to be a movement first and foremost towards connecting with God internally, but also preparing and reclaiming our lost skills. You know, when we were conned from leaving the farm by a materialistic system that was doomed for a quick and sudden failure, an epic collapse, leaving a zoo-like population to fend for themselves who had all become dependent on a system that had promised it would always be there for you, and it's not. And so for that time and period that it, we are now in, Jojo Magoo is the perfect example of the president that you do, we all deserve, right? <laughs> for the you know system that's in free fall. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paramano. Definitely reporting from the Apocalypse and the Ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.